Hi there. So it looks like we're recording. I'm going to share my screen. And this today, um, same day as my other ones, actually, this is going to be on the x-ray tube interaction. So what happens in the tube when the electrons hit that anode target? We have some interactions that are going to happen. So let me share my screen. All right. I just came to repair the x-ray tube, something in there. So he might be coming back in a minute. So x-ray tube interactions, we are going to go over tomorrow in class, but this will be for you to have and review over your um, days off for that material that you um, would have been doing on Thursday in class. So what's needed for x-ray production? So this is just a review of what we learned yesterday with the x-ray tube. Think about it. A source, a vacuum, a high potential difference, and a target. Where's each coming from? The source is from, think about it, the filament or the cathode side. The vacuum is our glass envelope. And the high potential difference is from the kilovoltage peak applied to that anode side that's retracting them over to number four, which is our target, our disk. As radiographer, we are going to set the factors that affect the x-ray beam quality and quantity. What is in the x-ray beam? It's meaning the beam that comes out of the tube. House quality and quantity related to that. What's our things? Energy level, that's our quality. How many, how much x-rays are we producing? How many electrons are we blowing off? That's all going to take a turn into how many x-rays we're going to be able to produce. So the beam quality and quantity, quantity and quality, are going to determine the image quality, as well as some things in our patient. And that's a whole nother chapter, guys. So quantity and quality is a technical factor. So there's my little Edison bulb that we select as electricity is traveling through the anode and cathode. Basically, electrons are going to be boiled off at the filament, stream across to the anode really, really fast. And from this is where that quantity and quality are going to be happening, really. High-speed electrons interact with the tungsten atom at the target, and photons are produced two ways, two types, two types of x-rays, I said yesterday, that we're going to have in the tube. Characteristic and Bremsstrahlung. That's our two types, characteristic x-rays or Bremsstrahlung x-rays. I can't tell them apart really, but we do need to know them and how they're made and what is happening at the tungsten atom. Bremsstrahlung is a German word, meaning breaking or slowing down of radiation. And that's exactly what happens with those filament electrons they get slammed right into the target of that tungsten atom and they are slowing down or breaking. Characteristic interactions are interactions that involve that filament electron interacting with an inner shell orbital electron of that target atom. What is the target atom made out of? W, tungsten. So it is interacting with the tungsten atom and causing ionization of the atom really that's what characteristic is, and we're going to get into detail a little bit more on each of these in a second. I got Brunstrong atom diagram drawn right here. That incoming electron is that straight line. That electron is not a wavelength. It's not on the EM spectrum, so it's just that incoming electron drawn as a straight line. It gets close to the nucleus of the atom, and it slows down or breaks and takes a turn. Remember, electrons are negative protons inside that atom are positive, so it's attracted to them, and it turns and leaves some energy behind in the form of a photon. So we see at that point of that curve, that photon is being drawn there. That's our image drawing of a Brimstrong interaction. Brims, kind of short for Brimstrong because it's hard to spell, fun to say though. That attraction causes the filament electron to slow down and change direction. In doing so, it loses kinetic energy released as a Brimstrahlung or a Brims photon. 
the closer that filament electron passes by that nucleus, the stronger the attraction is going to be and the more energy it's going to lose, resulting in a stronger X-ray photon. Hmm. That energy can be anywhere from the maximum KVP you set on the film on the control panel. So we don't know what the electron is going to be attracted at, but we know it could possibly be attracted to that maximum KVP set. So therefore it can lose almost all of that energy. As it's closer to the nucleus, the more energy it's going to lose. If it's farther from the less energy or almost no energy, so it's gonna be a lower energy photon produced. So that's why we get many different energies in our X-ray beam, Brimstraw. Characteristics is a little different. Characteristic interactions are interactions with the inner shell electrons. Mostly we're talking about specifically, we're worried more about K-shell interactions because that has the highest binding energy. And because we're ionizing an atom, we're knocking out an electron out of the K-shell of the tungsten atom. So characteristic photons are called so because their energy is characteristic of that binding energy because it has to knock it out. A tungsten atom has 74 electrons orbiting in those shells. The closer to the nucleus, the stronger the binding energy. And because it's knocking out an electron out of one of those shells, that electron is going to lose energy in the form of a photon. So we want the stronger energy photons. We want the inner shells specifically the K-shell. K-shell's binding energy in bold, you need to know, is the strongest of a tungsten atom because that's the closest to the nucleus, 69.5 keV. keV is a kilo electron voltage. That's a specific energy we know. kVp is just our maximum kilo voltage going through the tube. So in order to knock out an electron in a tungsten atom that is in the K shell, we have to have 69.5 or close to it to knock it out. So if we're going to make characteristic x-rays, we need 70 kVp minimum, around 70 at least. So in the diagnostic range of x-rays, we are only concerned with those photons that are coming from the K shell, the innermost shell. We could have it happen anywhere, but these are the ones we're talking about specifically with characteristics. In general, the filament electron enters the target atom, strikes that orbital electron. Its energy is greater or close to that binding energy. It's going to remove it. A vacancy is going to happen. Now, remember, atoms don't like to be unstable. So we have to fix that. Those electrons are going to bump into each other and to fill that vacancy. And when they do so, they're losing energy. That potential energy is called a characteristic X-ray photon. So we have characteristic X-ray photons being produced all across that atom shell, secondary photons. Now, when that first orbital electron drops in, it leaves another vacancy. So we have a second vacancy. We call this whole thing called a characteristic cascade each time they fall down and fill. And hold on one second. Let me stop and pause the video. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Good night. I don't know if I even got to pause that. I said stop video. I don't know. I think I just stopped me, but basically we'll continue on. So characteristic cascading is when those electrons are getting knocked out, they leave vacancies, and we have this kind of waterfall effect cascading down with new x-rays being produced. We have a picture of that coming up. Uh-oh, my thing is not advancing. Oh, there it is. Okay, lots and lots of little electrons here on this tungsten atom drawing and lots of things are going on. So in this one, we have an incoming, incoming electron knocking out ejected this electron. This is very confusing because this incoming electron has knocked this one out. 
it's leaving its energy. It lost its energy when it knocked this one out. So this arrow is resulting in a electron moving on away and flying out of that atom. Now this is cascading effects. Thank you. This little wave is the photon that was made when that little electron lost its energy in the form of a X-ray photon, a characteristic photon right there at that K-shell. This K-shell photon says it has a 59.0 keV. So pretty close to that 69.5. Now this all depends on what energy it got left with when it exited. All right, now we have one jumping in. It just so happened to be the L shell one right next door. And then that left a hole. So the M shell jumped in, then the N shell jumped in, then the O shell jumped in and so forth to kind of hopefully somewhat come to a stabilization. Now it doesn't always have to be that way depending on whatever orbiting shell was next door. It could have been an O shell and it filled into the K shell, or it could have been an N shell. Then whatever was behind would fall in or whatever was closest. Now that part gets a little more tricky. There's some math in the book. We don't need to worry about that. Now the subtraction of the difference between those two binding energies is gonna give us the value of that photon that's going to be reduced, produced after those vacancies are filled. We have X-rays being produced. But we know because of the way the binding energies work that these are lower binding energies. So these are not gonna be able to produce as strong of an X-ray or as penetrating X-rays. So you can see that this one has the shortest wavelength, the first one in the K-shell. And as we get further away, these are longer wavelengths. These are some weird looking wavelengths that's strong here too. But that is the cascading characteristic photons being made from cascading effect. All of them are characteristic photons. Now, somebody always asks me, what happens with this ejected electron? I don't really care. It doesn't matter to us because we don't have to test about it, but it could go on and do a reaction in another shell possibly. So it's a little free form floating away electron. Now, not all of our electrons that slam into that target are going to become a photon. A lot of them are going to become heat. Now, I have a minute here for you to draw those two interactions out of Brimstrong and a characteristic. Make sure your electron is a straight line. Your photons are a wavy line. Your Brimstrong should not interact with any, no touching of any electrons. It comes close to the nucleus and turns in a new direction, releasing energy from itself. Characteristics, hit, an, hit a K-shell electron specifically for your drawing purposes. And then you can draw in a cascade. All right, out of those two interactions, 99% of them become heat. 1% becomes an X-ray photon out of that 1%. 10% are characteristics, 90% brims. Ooh, a lot of brims. Because we only have two K shells, we have a very slim chance of knocking out a K shell in the atom. Now we know we're dealing with tungsten, so we know the makeup of it, so we know that binding energy of the K shell. Some scientists figured it out a long time ago. So let's just think about this. If I have 100 photons, 99 are gonna be heat, only one is going to be a X-ray photon. So I need to bump this up a little bit for this math to work out. Let's do a thousand. If I have a thousand electrons coming across, a hundred of them now, like I can't even think my math. Okay. If I have a hundred photons being made, I'd have to have, I'm going to need to be 1%. Ooh, hundred. How many electrons would I need? 10,000? No, I need 1,000. Yes, I had it right the first time. It's late in the day, guys. <laughs> so if I have 1,000, I'm going to get 100 x-ray photons. That's 1% of 1,000. Am I even thinking right? Let me do the math on my calculator. Oh, my goodness. I think I'm right. 1%. 
understand it because that just seems wrong when I'm saying it. Now, of course, my phone is not going to work. I know if I have 100, I'm only going to get one photon. So if I have 100 photons and 10% of them are characteristics, that's going to be 10 photons. Yeah, 1,000. Oh, wait, I did. Point oh one. It's only ten, so I would need ten thousand, ooh, ten thousand little electrons to make a hundred photons to get that to work. So if I have a hundred photons and ten percent of them are characteristic, that would be ten photons. Ninety of my photons would be brims. So that's how that number game works. We're never going to ask you that. We're not going to make you figure that out. But just to give you a picture of what's happening when we make x-rays. We're not making a tiny bit of electrons move across. We're making a lot. So when we set two mass or 50 mass, we're getting lots and lots of electrons. I haven't ever seen it written, so I don't know how many, but I do have a slide maybe coming up to show you a factor in this scenario. We do want you to know 99% of our x-ray interactions in the tuber heat and 1% of that is x-ray photons. Very inefficient x-ray production is not efficient. Now you can see why it took 15 minutes to get an x-ray of Bertha's hand. Now our two interactions are characteristic in brims. Majority of our photons are brims. Emission spectrums are some charts we're going to look at. You'll look at these a little bit more, but basically I want you to understand it's a graphic representation of what we can say. We know where this value is going to be. If we do this, this is going to change those values. So discrete emission spectrum is what we call characteristic and continuous emission spectrum is what we call our Bremsstrahlung. Discrete on characteristic because we know direct where that characteristic is going to happen right at that binding energy is 69.5. Brims are going to happen continuous throughout our ranges of KVPs and this will make more sense when we look at them. So here we see a line, a blue line for characteristic right at 69 and on this bell curve of the brims we can say from 0 to 100 we have a range of energies that we're going to have x-rays, the number of x-rays going up this way. So on a brims, you see that peak? Usually our peak for our brims is at one third of the KVP set. And we'll look at that in the book and highlight it. This chart kind of just gives you a general graph picture of what our spectrum of how many x-rays are gonna be down here on a brims chart. If we set, this looks like they stopped at about what, 95, 98 KVP maybe from zero to 98, we're gonna have brims, but not a lot maxed out. Most of them are gonna be around about 33. That might've been a 99 representation. I wish they would have made it exact for us. So if we do one third of that 99, we're gonna get 33. So right around here is most of our x-rays, about a third of that. Now we do have above 69.5. So we are gonna have some characteristics, quite a few there. So continuous, meaning all the way across, discrete, right at that level of where we know that energy is going to be for those characteristics. Discrete spectrum is, when we're talking about it, talking about characteristics. We know right where that energy is going to be. Very few differences up and down for characteristics. Continuous spectrum is showing us everything across for that energy range that we set on the control panel. Important to know that it's zero to the maximum KVP set is what our brims are gonna be, and that's our continuous spectrum. The average energy of our photons with a brims photon is gonna be one third of the KVP set. So if I set 75 KVP, one third of that's 25, most of my beam is 25 energy, 25 KeV. For each photon, we give it a kilo electron voltage energy. 
A graph of brims is always like a bell shape, starting with zero, going to that maximum KVP and the peak at that one third. Things that are gonna affect that, things that we would um, say could change that spectrum, changing KVP, changing MA, having something in our tube called tube filtration we're gonna talk about, having different generators on our machines. Our two machines are a certain type of generator, but when you get to the hospital, you might have a better one. So it's gonna affect that production. The material that that tungsten target is made out of will affect our emission spectrum. These are what you're gonna get into more in your next physics class. Here's one that's showing you some different energy levels. One looks like it's stopping just below 75, the green line, 72, I guess. And our other one is 82 kVp, so just past that 75. Look right there, blue line, 69.5. Why they didn't put it on the chart for us, I don't know. Our bell average on the lower kVp shifted slightly over, where our 82 kVp is slightly to the right for our higher one-third area. If they would have put that right at 75, our bell would have been right at 30 or right at 25, and it's just a little over off of it because they stopped it at 72, which they would have made that easier for us to see. So that's a change in KVP, how the curve of the bell changed. This is kind of hard stuff. Not going to have any of these on our exam. I do want you to know about that one third of the KVP setting is what our average energy is, and it can be from zero to the maximum KVP set. I have something, we'll talk about this filtration thing. I don't know why I haven't hit it yet in my slides. Filtration is something we're gonna to add to the tube. If we have filtration, it's gonna change our spectrums and our bell curves. Doesn't change that 69.5. We'll talk more about that in a minute. I guess I don't have my slide for it. All right, so let me talk about it here and then we'll show it in class where it'll make more sense. If I add filtration in the tube, this is little slits of aluminum we add in the tube, we're going to remove low energy photons that aren't gonna be good for our patient because they're so low energy. So it's gonna decrease the quantity, but it's gonna increase our average energy. So that's kind of weird looking at this four millimeters of aluminum. My number on that green chart, my number of x-rays is low because I have a lot more added filtration or aluminum filtering out x-ray photons, but my energy, average energy is high. They're both at the same KVP, see that? They both end at that maximum KVP. Two millimeters of aluminum though, I have more x-rays, but a lot of them are lower energy. My average energy shifted to the left at a lower average energy. So I like to say, you could say batting average if you're a sports person, but you guys, don't ask me, I can't do it, but you're gonna relate to the quizzes or the exams in your class. So we'll just say quizzes. If you have 10 quizzes and you make 100 on all of them, you have 100 average. If you have 10 quizzes and you make a zero on one, it's probably gonna bring you to a 90 average. If you have 10 quizzes and you make a zero on five of them, you're gonna have a 50 average. But what if we drop the lowest quiz grade? That's gonna up your average. So it's the same thing as filtration, filtering out, dropping some low numbers out of there that we don't need, increases the average. That's what happens when we add filtration in the tube. So I'll end on that and we'll talk more in class, but this is just a little review for you to have. So this makes more sense next week when we go into the next thing, which is patient interactions.